Soft Engineering Radio, episode 137, SQL with Jim Melton. This is Soft Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SC Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions and interviews on software engineering topics every 10 days. Thanks to our audience and the partners listed on our website for support. Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of Software Engineering Radio. Um, this is Arno and today I'm talking to Jim Melton about the SQL programming language. Jim, would you like to start by introducing yourself, say a couple of words about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, I've been editor of the SQL Standard now for well over two decades. Uh, I think that's a legal definition of crazy. Wow. <laughs> yes, uh, I've, in fact, I've published every edition of the Standard except uh, for the very first one, SQL 87. So it's, it's kind of a life sentence, I think. <laughs> I'm also actively involved uh, in the W3C. I am chairman of the XML Query Working Group there. I've been active in quite a few other standards efforts over the years. So basically, I'm just a standards professional. I, I uh, couldn't earn an honest living if I had to. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a very special kind of career. Uh, yes. um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I envy you there. <laughs> anyway. Um, what what would you say um, to to people like our listeners who who are application developers who have sort of have some exposure to databases but not are not really database geeks? Um, what would you say? What is the SQL programming language? Well, SQL is a, a declarative language. It's a non-procedural language for defining what the results of queries should look like and. It, it does not specify exactly how an SQL engine is supposed to execute the query, but it describes the criterion for the query. So the first thing that uh, most application programmers have to get used to is the fact that it is, in fact, non-procedural but declarative. And that has enormous advantages in a lot of different ways. The primary advantage is that it gives the engine the freedom to optimize queries however it sees fit, uh, and sometimes in ways that would never occur to the average program. Now, so, it is, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So the idea is um, not to, to think about the, the about performance, about the execution in the first place, but actually be expressive in a declarative way and leave the performance tuning to the query optimizer. That's exactly right. Now, in spite of the fact that uh, SQL is viewed as a query language, it does more than just retrieve information. It also can change information uh, in a database by adding new information, modifying existing information, or deleting information. So in that sense, it's not a functional language. It definitely has side effects. Um, but, but is the select sub language, is that a functional language? Very close to. Uh, the reason I would not say it's a completely functional language is because it is possible to invoke uh, what we call external functions, that is, functions that are written in some other programming language. And once you escape to this other programming language, we have no way of detecting what it is uh, that that little sub program is doing. Okay, so sort of a functional language with an escape hatch. Correct. Um, why is it even a programming language? It's, at first sight, it looks like it's just sort of four statements you can um, push to the, put to the database, select, insert, update, delete. Um, why would you even call that a programming language? It, it's well, so simple at first sight. I actually personally would not call it a programming language. What I do is call it a query language or a data sublanguage. Uh, because it's meant to interact with uh, either programs written in another language or directly with humans through an interactive tool. Now, there is an aspect of SQL. We call it in the standard PSM, for Persistent Stored Modules, that does add a real programming capability. And in fact, it's fairly procedural in its nature. 
uh, it has its analog in uh, real life products such as Oracle's PLSQL or in uh, Microsoft's uh, Transact SQL. So stored procedures are actually ha have actually been standardized. Yes, they actually have been. Unfortunately, the only vendor uh, of a major database product that implements PSM the way it's defined in the standard is IBM. Uh, the other major vendors already had their own variations, and they're reluctant to support yet another syntax for, for semantics they've already supported. Mm -hmm. How did SQL or, or SQL get started? What were the origins? Ah, way back when, we're talking 1978 time frame. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, it's got its roots a long time ago. Back when the uh, NFLs were in the caves. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Back when the Neanderthals were in the caves. Yeah, yes, the cavemen exactly. were. Yes, uh, and I was one of those Neanderthals. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I got my database start way before SQL, back in the network database days. But in any case, uh, Ted Codd, working for IBM, developed the relational model of data. And IBM spent a, a fair amount of effort and money developing uh, prototypes for a database management system that implemented something like the relational model. Somewhere along there, they began developing an actual query language to, um, to operate this database engine. A fellow named Don Chamberlain uh, and a friend of his uh, working at IBM developed this language that they called at the time SQL, S-E-Q-U-E-L. Uh, and I believe it did stand for something like standard, or, or I'm sorry, structured English programming language or something like that. Structured English query language. Um, at some point in time, and we're, we're now talking in the uh, early to mid 1980s, a database group was started under the auspices of ANSI to develop a standard for database query languages. And the first thing they worked on was a standard for network database language, codicil databases, if you will. But relational was becoming a hot topic in the, um, in the academic community. And people began bringing in proposals for another standard that they referred to at the time as RQL, or relational query language. That effort went on for two or three years, and it kept bogging down in disagreements over the style of the language. Until one day, a fellow named Phil Shaw, who also worked for IBM, brought in a proposal for a language that he called SQL, and it was derived directly from this work that Don Chamberlain had done on SQL. And that was the start of the standardization effort. It took, uh, I believe, about a year or so before the first version of uh, SQL went out for public review. And by 1986, very late 1986, it was standardized in the United States. And in early 1987, it was standardized internationally. What actually drove the, the standardization of the language? Um, who, who was interested in actually standardizing this? I mean, it's, um, that was in the old days when vendor lock-in was not perceived as a bad thing. So what got the vendors to get together and actually standardize this in such a good way? Um, it, it's unclear exactly what the driving factors were for most of the organizations. Uh, I know for some of the, the vendors who eventually became the dominant ones, like Oracle, IBM, and uh, Sybase, the driving motivation was the ability to have the, the illusion of portability so that, <laughs> yes, I'm being honest here, um, so that you could sell your system to a, a, a customer and allow him to believe that there was some chance he would be able to port his programs and would not have vendor lock-in. So even though vendor lock-in was not a big issue then, it was on people's minds nonetheless. The other th factor, though, is that it allowed incredible creativity in the engine itself, 
uh, for example, in the optimizer or in how the storage system itself was managed, because unlike Codicil databases, uh, the, the language was declarative and it gave enormous flexibility for optimizers to do really dramatic improvements over what a, a, a human programmer might be able to create. Ah, so before um, the SQL standardization effort, the query languages were not um, were not declarative but procedural. Very much so. Ah, oh, I see. Uh, w which corresponded directly to the nature of the database systems themselves. For example, a, a codicil database, uh, also known as a network database, was a highly interconnected structure of records and one had to write an application program in such a way that it would literally pick up a link in one record that pointed to another record and then it would have to follow that link, open the new record, put it into a different buffer. All of the logic was in the application program itself. Yeah, that sounds pretty um, procedural. And very error prone. So how how comprehensive was this first standardization effort? What was in this in it in, in the beginning, and how did it evolve later? Well, the first version of the standard was, I I, I think it's really fair to call it a toy language. Uh, it was very much a first step. I would even say a baby step because it provided only the basic four statements that you've talked about and a relatively mm -hmm. small number of expressions. Uh, putting the usual arithmetic expressions. Uh, I don't believe it even had uh, string concatenation. You know, so it was, it was very restrictive language, but it got the doors open to actually developing a real language. Um, in SQL 89, a minor revision of the language was published that added uh, what, one, what we called at the time referential integrity. Now this was only restrictive referential integrity in such a way um, that if you attempted to do an operation such as delete a row that would violate the referential integrity, you would get an error. And, that, and that's all there was to it. Then you had to figure out how to uh, correct that problem in your application. Mm -hmm. By the time SQL 89 was published, work had already begun on the next generation of the language, which eventually was published as SQL 92, although it was called SQL 2 during its development. That was the first version of the language uh, in which entire applications could be built by using only the facilities in standard SQL. For example, in SQL 86 and 89, there were no data, uh, data how to say this. There were data definition statements like create table, but there were no uh, data structure manipulation statements uh, like alter table to add a new column or to drop a column. So in SQL 92, we added all of those additional statements for maintaining the structure of the database as well as for maintaining the content of the database. We also vastly increased the different kinds of expressions, built-in functions, uh, new operators, etc. So it really was a very powerful language by the time SQL 92 was published. Then we started work on what went by the name of SQL 3 for a while. It was eventually published seven years later as SQL 1999. Uh, this is the period during which we developed so-called object-oriented SQL. And what's that? We spent vast numbers of hours, uh, vast numbers of months, arguing about the object model that an SQL database system should support. The idea was that we wanted tables and databases to be used as object repositories. And in fact, uh, there, another group was formed called ODMG, the Object Database Management Group, and they participated along with the SQL people for a while uh, to help us develop an object model that would satisfy their requirements, and then they would use a subset of SQL as a query language for objects within each of their language. 
So we did eventually develop an object model that allows us to store rows and tables that are uh, two-sided coin. On the one side of the coin, they're just ordinary rows and ordinary tables, but you flip the coin over and on the other side, it looks like an object stored in an object repository, complete with object references and all the usual kind of things you would expect in an object repository. What's the difference between a foreign key and an object reference? What do you mean by having object semantics in the database? Ah, well, that was part of what we argued about so for so very long. Uh, the way it ended up in SQL 1999, there is very little difference. The only difference that um, I think, no, I'm sorry, the only two differences that I think are really relevant are, one, we added something called structured types, which allows you to store, even in a column of a database, a very complex uh, data structure. Mm -hmm. But if, if you apply that complex data structure, the structured type, as a row of a table, you now really do have a perfectly ordinary table with perfectly ordinary rows in it, each um, um, attribute, if you want to call it that, of the object that is stored there or each field of the structured type uh, looks like an attribute of an object. And it has methods on it, uh, methods for retrieving the value, methods for changing the value, and you can write arbitrary numbers of user-defined methods. So it really does begin to feel like objects. The other difference, though, is that we did not depend on referential integrity per se for referencing these objects. And the reason for that is because referential integrity is, a, is purely a value-based concept in an SQL environment. So the value that is stored in one column of one table must be equal to the value of some column in some other table. Whereas with object references, we did not want to have to depend on this value base. We wanted to have something a little more abstract. So we created something called a reference type. And the reference type is, oh, its implementation defined what the contents are, but it is in most implementations something like a row ID which is you know, just an abstract thing that your database system produces. It could even be literally a disk address, mm -hmm. or it could be uh, the number of the row in some sequential ordering of the rows in a table. The standard doesn't say what it has to be. But the, the big value of the object references or of the reference type is that you can bring them into your application program and send them back into the database system. So, so they have some sort of a non-value usage even in the application program. Okay, I see. How did it go on after that? Well, I believe that the object-oriented SQL stuff was not a very big success. Um, no vendor that I know of has implemented all of it. Uh, Oracle has implemented part of it, Sybase implemented part of it, IBM implemented part of it, and the parts all overlap. Uh, but the, the, the overlapping subset, the, the intersection of all of those subsets is not big enough, I think, to, to build meaningful applications. Consequently, we didn't get the uptake in customer usage that we had hoped for. Uh, and, and it was extremely expensive to develop. So, so we learned a lot of lessons while we were doing that, and we are not ever again going to do anything that substantial, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, after SQL 1999 was published, we began working on a version that eventually was published as SQL 2003. SQL 2003 was... I think you could properly call it a maintenance version of the standard. It fixed uh, a tremendous number of bugs, and it added only a small number of new features. We just recently published, uh, in fact, this year, in fact, uh, SQL 2008, which uh, was more than just a maintenance version. We added a number of new features, but nothing nearly as notable as object-oriented SQL. And we are currently working on the 
subsequent version of the standard, which we hope will be called SQL 2011, <laughs> but it's possible it could slip into 2012. Mm -hmm. The truth is that a lot of people consider SQL to be done. That right now what we're doing is um, adding features that are more of interest to specific vendors or maybe two or three vendors uh, to one or two vertical marketplaces, but that don't have the same broad attraction that SQL uh, did in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So the core is pretty stable and there's things being added that are, well, the more that's added, it's sort of the, the end of a, of a curve that's being, that might go on forever, but is less and less interesting to the majority of people. Yeah, I, th I think that's an accurate way of putting it. If you view um, a normal bell curve, we're pretty far out on one of the tails, probably at least one or two standard deviations out. Okay, but let's take a look at the, at the core of SQL. Um, I expect that most listeners are familiar with select star from table person or something like that. Um, right. How do you, do you go from there? What's, what kind of expressions, what kind of features does SQL provide? Would ah. Oh, it's kind of hard to sum it up. Uh, well, just start, and start somewhere. But, but I'll try. Uh, probably the first thing that uh, an application programmer will encounter a need for is to combine information from two or more tables. And the, the way one does this is typically through an operation that we call join. And SQL provides a number of different kinds of join, but in general, the process uh, is that you take rows in one table and match them based on the contents of certain columns that you specify two rows in another table, and you create a new virtual table that has the number of columns that's equal to the number of columns in the first table plus the number of columns in the second table, and you start off with a number of rows that's the product of the number of rows in the first table and the number of rows in the second table. You might call that a cross product, but then you filter that according to the join criteria. So if the join criteria says that the employee ID in this table has to be equal to the employee ID in that table, then you can throw away all of that cross product in which that equality is not true. And now you're left with a, a small, much smaller, much more usable subset of this cross product of, of rows in the two tables. After that, you can apply further filtering with the ordinary where clause in SQL that allows you to specify arbitrary predicates to, de to select only those rows that are meaningful. For example, you might choose to retain only those rows for which uh, the salary is less than 100,000 euros. Mm -hmm. Once you have gone that far, the, the last operation is actually what we call the select list. Uh, in the syntax of SQL, it is uh, the select star or select a list of column names. So this very wide virtual table that has all the columns from the first table joined with all the columns of the second table, you now project that virtual table onto a specified number of other columns, and you now have a narrower table um, that has only the columns that have the semantics that you've requested. What's the difference between an inner join and an outer join? An inner join is pretty much what I've just described, where you retain only those rows from the first table and the second table where there's um, a match on the join condition. An outer join allows you to say, but I also want to keep all of the rows in the first table that don't have any matches at all in the second table. Uh, an example of that might be, I would like to know about all of my employees and the projects they're assigned to, but even if I have employees that don't have any projects uh, on their plate right now, I want to know about them as well. So in that case, you would do an outer join, and if you were saying let's join employees with projects, you do a left outer join because you want to retain all of the employees that don't have projects. 
If you wanted information about the projects that don't have employees assi assigned to them, you would do a write outer join instead. And if you want information about both those employees that don't have projects on their plates as well as projects that have no employees assigned to them, you can do what's called a full outer join. Now, one has to ask, what about all those columns in the virtual table that correspond to the rows from the other table, the one in which there are no matches? Well, the values of those virtual columns are just set to the SQL null value. Um, what about null? What's the meaning of null in SQL? I was hoping you would ask that. Uh, nulls have turned out to be both one of the most useful features of SQL that most other languages uh, don't have, and also one of the most controversial. The meaning of a null value is precisely what your application wants it to mean. <laughs> yeah, I, I know I'm deliberately being vague. Um, but I think the way I always explain it to people is that the null value means there is no value here. It is a placeholder for a location where you could store a value if you wanted to, but there's not one to there's not one there right now. Now you could say it means that the information is unknown or the information is missing or the information is not applicable. In fact, an ANSI group uh, a number of years ago wrote a paper that came up with I think this is the the right value. 29 possible meanings for the null value. <laughs> but still, null does not equal null. Absolutely. Because you could substitute any other value for a null. And therefore, in advance, you can't tell whether two nulls will have the same value or have different values. So it's not equal. It's also not not equal. So you, so, so you have some kind of tri-state logic. Absolutely. And the third, the third state is unknown. This sounds pretty weird. Could you sort of give examples of that? Um, well, we, we build logic tables, of course. So let me just sketch out an example of, of how the AND operation would work. If I say that I have one predicate whose truth value is false and another predicate whose truth value is true, let's call them x and y, the result of x and y has got to be false because a false ended with a true is also false. It's only a true ended with a true that can be true. That's ordinary Boolean logic. Everybody understands that. But what if one of those truth values had the value unknown instead of true or false. What is the result of anding a true value with an unknown value? We don't know. The answer could be true or false. So in the logic tables that we build in the standard, uh, we say that the result of true and unknown is unknown. But false and unknown is always going to be false. So the answer there is going to be false. It's not unknown. So if I compare two columns, let's say the name column in the person and the project lead name column in the project, and both are null, then this comparison will not be true, although they are, from a perspective of, of normal programming languages, procedural languages, they would be the same, but in SQL it's unknown. That is correct. Why was that done? Well, this is why it was very controversial and remains controversial to this day. Because eventually it is possible that the programmer name could be substituted with a real name, Arno Haas. And it is possible that the project lead name could be substituted could actually get a real name assigned to it, possibly Jim Melton. Now, once those two assignments had been made, the result of the comparison is going to be false. But if the project lead name were said to be Arno Haas, then the result of the comparison would be equal. 
So until we have actual values, we don't know whether the result is going to be true or false, and it is misleading to pretend that we do know. So because the first name, the name of the employee is not known, and the name of the project lead is not known, then of course the result of comparison, comparing the two is not known. Okay, so now we have this tri-state logic, we have joins. What else is there? Well, um, one of the earliest things that we discovered wa was extremely valuable is something that we call a subquery. Uh, some people call that an inner select. A subquery is a small query, a, like another select statement, if you will, that's embedded inside an outer query. Now, if you really get down to the relational algebra, the relational algebra is uh, a way of, it, of defining and expressing the semantics of the relational model. If you really analyze the relational algebra associated with subqueries, you discover that they're nothing more than a different syntax for expressing joins. But sometimes expressing this relationship as a subquery is much more valuable, much more intuitive than expressing it in the form of a join. Here's an example. We want projects, and for, for all of our projects, we want to have, we want to select only those projects for which the sum of the employee's salaries is more than a million euros. Now, now, I can certainly express this by doing a join between projects and employees and computing the, the sum of the employees and filtering it out inside a, a where cause and so forth. But sometimes it's more natural to say select uh, project ID from projects where then you can say, open parenthesis, select the, uh, the sum of the salaries of employees assigned to that project is greater than a million. And express that as another select inside the where clause of the outer select. Mm -hmm. You can also use these subqueries in the select list itself. Uh, so there's a, it, it's, it's pretty much composable. Uh, maybe not fully composable in the sense that a lot of uh, functional languages are defined, but it's pretty composable so that the subselect subqueries can be included in a number of different places in the syntax of the outer query. Okay. Um, you know, do you mentioned some kind of uh, several times that there are lots of functions in SQL. What about that? Ah. There are quite a number of, of built-in functions in SQL. Um, some of them are trivial. For example, we have a, a function called current time. Uh, it takes no arguments, and it returns whatever the system believes the current time is. We have other functions that do take arguments, like substring, for example. Uh, substring takes one string, a starting position, and optionally a length. Uh, of the substring to extract. We have functions that implement regular expression semantics. So you can do regular expression matching. Uh, you can also do regular expression extraction and substitution. Uh, we have mathematical functions. Um, we have what we might call statistical functions. And in fact, uh, in the SQL 2003 timeframe, we added a large number of functions to do uh, OLAP processing, online analytical processing. So there, there's quite a few functions for that. How well are these functions standardized between vendors? Actually, very well. Uh, the great majority of the built-in functions uh, are implemented by the vendors using the precise semantics that's in the standard. Uh, a number of the vendors have chosen not to use the exact syntax for some of the early functions because we define those functions using sort of a keyword approach rather than comma-separated arguments. For example, the substring function has substring. The first argument is the string from which you're going to extract the substring. But instead of a comma following that, we have the keyword from. 
and then the second argument is the starting position within that first string where you want the substring to be extracted. But instead of following that with another comma, we have the keyword for. And the third argument, if you provide it, is the length, the number of characters or number of bits that you want to extract from the substring. Mm -hmm. So some of the vendors really didn't like this keyword approach, and they've just used ordinary functional notation with commas separating the arguments. Except for that, though, the, the vendors really have picked up the correct semantics, and in many of the cases where the standard chose to use the comma-separated syntax rather than the keyword syntax, the vendors have implemented exactly as specified in the standard. Okay, you, you started out by saying that since SQL is a declarative language, programmers should not worry about the performance and just be as expressive as possible and leave the optimization to the query engine. Let's take a look at what's going on there. Um, what kind of optimizations does a query optimizer actually do? Ah, here's a very trivial one. Uh, if we want to do a join where we say we're matching employees with departments, the naive way of actually executing such a join would be to linearly go through the employees table and every row you would then linearly go through the uh, projects table looking for projects that matched whatever criteria you set up relative to that one employee row. Now, that's an extremely naive and inefficient way of executing the joins. So instead, you'll find that real relational engines will probably have built indexes that allow them to locate rows in the employees table or locate rows in the projects table that are directly related to the criteria of the join. Uh, so instead of doing, uh, you know, a scrolling join or whatever you want to call it, uh, the matches are done vastly more effectively by going and finding the exact rows that you're looking for based on known criteria. Now, of course, if you don't have the capability of, of searching an index for a particular kind of match, you might have to resort to scrolling through an entire table. But I found that a lot of the optimizers will actually build a quick index on the side because they suspect that it's going to be used a number of times in this query. So they'll build a temporary index and use it for the duration of the query and then perhaps release it. So, so a query optimizer might actually build an index that is not explicitly declared by the application. I Yes, that is correct. It's kind of surprising to, to hear, but I've, yes, I've heard of optimizers that do that. Okay, what, what else might a query optimizer do apart from using indexes? Um, uh, as with any programming language, uh, optimizers have a lot of different strategies. Uh, a very, another very trivial one that an SQL optimizer might do is uh, inlining functions. So it would go essentially grab the code associated with a function that's written either in SQL or built into the language and put the code in line rather than have, have to go through the context switching of calling a subroutine. Um, it also might do common expression extraction, and that's especially valuable if you have subqueries. If you have a very, very similar or even identical subquery in multiple parts of your query, Using uh, common expression extraction, uh, you can do tremendous improvements in the performance rather than doing the naive approach of actually invoking subqueries multiple different times in different places um, and coming up with essentially the same results every time. So, so there's a, a huge variety of things. I have to say that I believe the people who build SQL engine optimizers have got to be among the smartest people on the planet. Wow. Some of the stuff they come with is just incredibly creative, stuff I would never think of. So the idea is basically to actually really trust those smart guys rather than try to be smarter than them. <laughs>
Well, that's the idea. It doesn't always work, though. Uh, customers are incredibly, or I should say users, are incredibly creative when it comes to writing queries. And they're constantly coming up with queries that the guys who are writing the optimizers never even imagined would happen. <laughs> and therefore, the optimizer either just doesn't recognize the structure of the query and doesn't do anything smart with it, or it might actually misinterpret the query and do something bad with it. As a result of this potential problem, uh, almost all the implementations have the ability to show the application programmer or to show the database administrator uh, what's called a query plan. It says, well, we broke the query down in this way, so we do a join here, we do an equality match here, we do uh, a union here, you know, we do all these operations in this order. Well, a really smart query author might look at that and go, boy, that's going to be really efficient, really inefficient for the kind of query I'm really executing here. Let me see if I can rephrase the query in a, in a different way that will allow the optimizer to understand what I'm trying to do. One possible example there would be, maybe I'll do the join explicitly rather than do a subquery and have the uh, depend and hope that the optimizer recognizes that it's supposed to be doing a particular kind of join. Oh yeah, I see. Uh huh. So sort of try around and then always get the feedback what the query optimizer actually does with the query. Precisely. And if you don't like if you don't like it, you might be able to restructure the query. Uh, most of the time, you end up calling your support people and telling them uh, your query optimizer is not working. So, in the next version of your product, I hope you fix this. <laughs> okay, um, let's take a look at the data types that SQL supports. Um, what what's the range of of data types that's present? Well, I I don't think anybody's going to be surprised at it. Uh, we have several different numeric types. Uh, we have integers, and they come in at least three flavors. There's small int, integer, and big int. The only requirement is that uh, big int have a precision that's not smaller than the precision of integer, and small int have a precision that's not greater than the precision of integer. Oh, sort of, sort of, sort of like C. Actually, there's no guarantee at all? That's correct. There's no guarantee that a big int will have more precision than a small int. Or no guarantee at, as to the minimum precision at all. That's correct. Uh, this is the kind of thing that we expect that the marketplace would sort out because nobody's going to buy a product where a small int has two bits of precision <laughs> and a big int has five bits of precision. Mm -hmm. Now, as it happens, uh, Oracle, for example, the precision of big int int, small int, is identical, and that's, it's, I believe, 39 digits, decimal digits. So the precision is very big. You, you don't get any benefits by saying small int over saying big int within an Oracle implementation. But, but isn't that sort of wasteful with, uh, with, with regard to space? Nah, not really. Uh, this, this is a place where the engine people have gotten extremely intelligent. Uh, so, for example, Oracle does not actually have fixed-length columns uh, of 39 digits. Uh, it's a variable-length column inside the row, and so rows might expand or shrink as you change the value that's stored in the column. Wow, that sounds really smart and really hard to come up with. Um, it actually wasn't that hard to come up with. Consider the problem of a character string column. Uh, the SQL standard defines two kinds of character strings. Uh, there's fixed length character strings, and there's variable length character strings. Well, once we had variable length character strings, uh, you don't want to always allocate, let's say, 64K bytes for the maximum possible variable length character string. Uh, so instead, virtually all the vendors either have variable length columns or they store the character string. Um, external to the row and just have a link to it. So they might have a heap where they're storing the actual character string values itself and link to the heap from the, from, from the row itself. But doesn't, I mean, for, for, for strings, I, I see where that's useful, but for numbers, doesn't that add significant overhead rather than sort of having them in the row? Uh, 
It, it adds um, another interaction for any number. I don't believe that Oracle stores the numbers external to the row. I believe it's always in the row. It's just a variable length. So rows are sort of variable lengths. Indeed. Going on with the kinds of data types that we have, in addition to the numeric types that I've mentioned, uh, we also have, uh, there's actually three kinds of character string. We have regular character string, fixed length, variable length, and we also have um, Clubs, character large objects. We have a uh, byte data type uh, called binary where you can store byte strings and they come in fixed length, variable length, and blobs, uh, binary large objects. There are date time types. There are interval types that to express the difference between two date times. Uh, there's a Boolean type that allows you to express true, false, or Guess what? Unknown. Uh, and then, of course, there's user-defined types. And user-defined types come in two flavors. One is the structured types that I mentioned earlier, where you can have arbitrary structured, complex structures of, of data defined to be stored in a single column of a database. We also have something we call distinct types. So one might define, for example, uh, a type called IQ, that is a distinct type based on uh, integer. Well, it's not very meaningful to add two IQs together. Tr trust me, the IQ of a project is not the sum of the IQs of its, <laughs> of its participants. <laughs> it's not even the average. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the point of a distinct type is that you do not inherit the operations of the parent type you have to define your own operations. So you define methods on the distinct types. So you would define a method on IQ that perhaps allows you to compare two IQs, but not to add the IQs together. Mm -hmm. Coming back to, the, um, to the, the string types, why is there a distinction between the variable length characters and a CLOB? They're both variable length. Why, ha why have two different types? That, that was also a controversial discussion. Um, we, and, and we really debated it very seriously for a long time before accepting the CLOB. The reason boiled down to giving hints to the engine. It was felt that uh, most implementations would adopt a maximum length for varying length character strings that was, let's say, reasonable enough that you would actually store it inside the row, uh, like possibly a maximum limit of 1K characters or 1K bytes even. Does the standard specify the maximum length or the minimum maximum length? Absolutely not. The, the maximum length is implementation defined. So I know of one implementation where the maximum length of a, vari of a variable length character string is four gigabytes. Uh, wow. I know of another implementation where the maximum length is 200 bytes. Oh. So they vary tremendously. Now, the idea of accepting the CLOB is to give a hint to the engine that this could get very, very large, and therefore you probably want to store this external to the row and just link to it. So once again, I know implementations where the maximum size of a CLOB is uh, 4 giga characters, 4 billion characters. And I know others where it's the square of 4 billion characters. Wow. Yeah. But that would fill up my hard disk. <laughs> how, how big is the, the performance impact, typically, of using a CLOB over using a variable length character? I think that in real implementations, the performance hit is actually pretty modest. Uh, one does end up doing something like a join, but because the link is very direct, um, it sometimes means only one additional fetch out of the database. And a good optimizer will actually do prefetches because as it's processing the rows, it knows that there's the potential for the blob or CLOB column to be addressed, and so it can initiate a prefetch to make sure that at least the first chunk 
of the C-Lob is already available. So I think the performance hit in general is pretty minor. What would you suggest? Do you have any suggestions for, for developers, sort of best practices, some advice for people who are not seriously experts in SQL, but write database applications, how to go about it? Um, what would your advice be? Uh, that's actually very hard for me to say because it's been so many years since I actually developed applications. Uh, right now, I, I write applications uh, in XSLT, for example, rather than in SQL mm -hmm. or, or C or anything else. Um, I think the best practices uh, are going to vary widely based on the kind of application one is doing. Uh, for example, if one is doing an application that requires a lot of uh, string processing, you're going to have a totally different approach to writing your SQL statements than if you're doing financial applications. Um, and just to be honest, I'm just not competent to, to give advice on best practices for SQL coding in general. The one thing that I would suggest is that modularization is probably more important in SQL than it is in, in most other programming. What do you mean by modularization? Think about your query, various queries, in terms of the different components of it. Instead of just saying, well, I've got four tables that I need to correlate and immediately doing a four-way join, think really carefully about whether it's better to express one of those joins in terms of a subquery also, you might think in terms of uh, how many rows you actually think are going to participate in the join from the first table, the second table, the third table, and so forth, and find out how your optimizer treats a join in terms of precedence it gives based on left-to-right expression of the join or right-to-left expression of the join, and put the tables with the smallest cardinalities in the position in the join that uh, is accessed first. Therefore, you are giving the optimizer a lot of hints where it can do a much better job of organizing your queries to minimize disk accesses. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of little hints like this that you can get out of your uh, implementation's documentation, but it's extremely difficult to generalize. But, but that's a kind of a modularity that I, that I have in mind. Oh, I see. Okay. It's also a good idea, whenever possible, to use stored procedures or something very close to stored procedures, whereby your queries are prepared well in advance, they're fully optimized, and all you do is invoke them. It's a little bit like calling a compiled subroutine. Uh, the, the contrary viewpoint of that is... Uh, what we call dynamic SQL, where you submit the query in real time for it to be compiled and optimized and then executed. That's massively inefficient. You should do that only if you're interacting with a human being at, at, a, at a tool of some sort and you don't know what kind of queries the human is going to cause you to execute. But isn't there some sort of level in between at the driver level that the drivers sort of pre-compile the queries or make sure the database pre-compiles the queries and have a query cache of the typically executed queries even without having them in stored procedures? Absolutely. Uh, most implementations, or at least most commercial implementations, do something like that. They do cache queries. They may even cache the results of relatively small, uh, if the results are relatively small. Um, the problem is, that's an implementation-defined capability. It can't be part of the standard. Um, and you can't necessarily depend on your implementation doing that or doing a good job of it. Some implementations, for example, might only cache two dozen queries. And when you come to the 25th one, it either throws away the first one or all the 25th, 26th, etc., all have to be treated treated just as though they were ordinary dynamic SQL. So thinking about it yourself and trying to, trying to make sure that you organize your queries in a reasonable way and 
making stored queries where it's going to be of general use, possibly to several different application programs, uh, is a very smart way of, of making sure that your performance potential is maximum. You're using the term um, stored queries. Um, you're not, we're not saying stored procedures, and this is since it's so controversial. I'll be I'll ask specifically. Um, are you talking about storing basically a single select statement in the database and call that? Or are you talking about, or are, is your advice to actually put the logic into stored procedures? Yeah, I was a bit casual with my language. It would actually be in a stored procedure or or a stored function. We don't have the capability of storing just a naked query in, in the database in the SQL stand. It, it has to be wrapped inside a, a stored procedure or a stored function. But is your advice to actually put a single select statement into a stored function, stored procedure, or were you, was your advice to move, to massively move application logic into stored procedures and stored functions? Just ah. to, to be clear about what your advice actually was. The, the specific advice that I was giving at that moment was to put an individual query into uh, a procedure, a stored procedure or a stored function. Mm -hmm. But you raise a very interesting point, and that is uh, moving more of your application logic into a stored procedure. Now, there's a lot of controversy about this. Uh, different people have radically different viewpoints. My viewpoint is the fewer context switches you have, the greater potential you have for increasing optimization. Not only do you forego the actual CPU cost associated with changing processes or context in some other way, but by putting all of your application logic or more of your application logic into a single language, you now have the opportunity to have an optimizer that can optimize not only the query portion of your applications, but the logic portion of your applications all at the same time. Typically, your application has some kind of user interface, so you'll have the context switches anyway. Yes, of course. But, but there are huge portions of large applications that don't involve uh, user interface. Uh, large amounts of computations. I've, I've seen applications that were hundreds of pages of C code that have exec SQL select, exec SQL select, uh, what we call uh, embedded SQL statements. Mm -hmm. And every time you do an exec SQL, you now have to do a context switch between the C portion of the application and the database portion of the application. The database engine and its optimizer can only see the SQL statement, and it doesn't understand, can't even see the, uh, the C code. So it, there's no possibility of doing optimization that crosses query boundaries. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you were to rewrite that portion of your application in, say, SQL PSM, your optimizer now gets the bigger picture. It can say not only, ah, he's trying to do a loop here. I know how to do loops in a smarter way by extracting sub-expressions. He can also say, aha, this query and that query have a lot of similarity to them. So I will create a query that is exactly the intersection between the two sub-queries, compile it, cache it away one time, and then we'll only do the, the differences between the two queries as a special case in the two different places where they're invoked. What is your take on object relational mapping tools? Oh, I think they've gotten a whole lot better in the last few years. Uh, they started off as a good idea, but not ready for prime time. But in the last few years, I've seen some really good tools. No, I can't give you any names because I don't play with these things very much. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've, I've seen some really nice tools that do object relational mapping in quite intelligent ways. Um, unfortunately, most of them do not take advantage of the object-oriented SQL facilities. They just map them directly into ordinary tables. Uh, sometimes they do take advantage of the structured types in SQL, but not all vendors implement that, so you're kind of narrowing the range of implementations uh, to which that's applicable. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, is there anything you'd like to to sort of wrap this this interview up with? Well, uh, one of the things that I always have to do is plea for more people to participate. Uh, the biggest problem we have in the SQL standards development area is that we are down to a very small core of people from a ver from really the major vendors, uh, the five or six biggest vendors, um, to develop the language. And sometimes we're not really certain whether our ideas are the ones that are generally applicable. We would like more participation, not only from vendors, but more especially from actual users of the language. And even if people cannot participate by attending meetings, they can always review the documents when they're published for ballot in their in their own country, um, and submit comments to tell us whether they like what we're doing or whether they found bugs. So more participation is a good thing. So comments are actually welcome and well regarded, and it actually, yeah, if if one of the listeners actually wants to participate, he's welcome to share his opinions. Absolutely, we welcome it. Uh, if the comments are really sufficiently good, I'll travel over and buy the guy a beer. Cool. Okay, well, thank you very much for taking the time for the interview, and thanks for sharing your insights about the SQL programming language. My pleasure, Arno. Thanks for inviting me. Bye. Thanks for downloading and listening to Software Engineering Radio. Software Engineering Radio is an educational program brought to you by Hillside Europe. If you want more information about the podcast and all the other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. If you want to support us, you can donate to the SE Radio team via the website. Or you can advertise for SE Radio, for example, by clicking on the Dick, Reddit, Delicious and Slashdot buttons. To contact the team, please send email to team at se-radio.net or if it is specific to an episode, please use the comments facility on the website so other people can react to your comments. This episode of SE Radio as well as all other episodes are licensed under a Creative Commons 2.5 license. Please see the website for details. Thanks to Charlie Crow and the Podsafe Music Network for the music used in this show. The song is called Vegas Hard Rock Shuffle. <laughs>